So what I'd like to do, um, we thank everyone for joining us. I'm going to pull up a little bit of just a quick slideshow on my screen here to tell you about um, Southern Lit Alliance. We are really excited today. We have people from all over the United States joining us. So um, there are lots of people out there who've probably not heard of Southern Lit Alliance. Uh, we are a literary arts organization and in, based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we, at least in the recent past, have brought in authors from all over the country. We do a uh, Southern Literature Festival every other year. We do writing contests for kids, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, just a variety of things in the literary arts. I want to thank starting off First Horizon, who is sponsoring our Southbound series uh, virtually right now uh, as we bring different authors on from around the country. We really appreciate their support to make this happen. Here's what we're about. Southern Lit Alliance's mission is to provide engaging literary arts experiences. We want to encourage just passionate readers and writers and get the next generation on board with books. Here's a list of some of the programs that we do. We did a creative writing workshop online for teens this summer, which was, they just loved it. They wanted an extra week. So we did go an extra week before school started. We do have authors online right now, um, every month or so, and are planning um, some for the fall right now. Our next event, on the screen is our Yahoo Fest, which celebrates uh, young adult genre literature for teens and preteens. The um, sorry, it is a free event. We'll have thirty authors that will be online. It will be September fourteenth through the seventeenth, with sessions at noon, so you can do it at your lunchtime. And then at seven at night, and there will be panels of authors discussing this. So check that out at yahoofest.org if you're uh, interested. Um, we are reliant upon donors to keep us going and to do what we do. So we would greatly appreciate it. This is a free event, but we greatly appreciate it if you'd consider maybe a gift to help us continue these. As you can see here, um, here's the impact that your donation would make to provide just all kinds of programs around literature, reading, and writing. So you can go to southernlitalliance.org for more information about our programs as well as to make a donation. So I am going to um, now introduce to you our author, let's skip ahead, uh, is Kristen Harmel. I'm going to stop sharing and welcome her. Uh, how are you, Kristen? I'm doing well. How about you? Good. So you tell me the Book of Lost Names has now made the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a lot. That's so exciting. We're so honored to have you. So it's such a great book to read. So a little bit about Kristen here. Um, she has been a USA Today bestselling author now, as well as New York Times bestselling author. Another book uh, that she published is The Winemaker's Wife, but she has dozens of other novels that have been actually translated into languages all over the world and has been well known. She started out as a journalist, as um, a sports writer for a magazine in Tampa Bay at a young age, and then moved on. She uh, wrote for People Magazine, interviewing all kinds of the people, the likes of Ben Affleck and Matthew McConaughey. Uh, so I'm sure she has lots of great stories to tell, but she says her favorites were the heroes among us, just the average people that had incredible things happen in their lives and telling those kinds of stories. So I'm sure that is a lot of what has inspired her to go on to do some of this historical fiction. Uh, she was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and lived there as a child. Um, she moved to Columbus, Ohio, and then St. Petersburg, and got a degree in journalism um, with a minor in Spanish from the University of Florida. We won't hold that against you here in Tennessee. <laughs> um, she's, been, she's lived in Paris and Los Angeles, and now she lives in Orlando with her son and husband and is joining us from Cocoa Beach on a little vacation. So 
we open it up to you, Joe, and um, not Joe, I'm looking at Joe, my intern. Kristen, we're <laughs> giving it up to you to tell us all about your book and share some of your research. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. And thanks, Joe, um, Linda's intern, Joe, for helping out today. This is wonderful. Yeah, of course. Great, great to see everyone. And thanks to all of you out there who are joining us on this Sunday afternoon. I see a few friends. I see Anissa. I see Catherine Stillwell there. Um, my screen's not showing everyone, but it looks like a lot of people have joined us. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so uh, Linda did a great job with that introduction. Um, I, will, I will dive right in. Um, so I'm the author of a dozen novels, the first of which came out in 2006. And in 2012, with the sweetness of forgetting, I began writing about World War II, and I have not been able to stop. This it just it feels like my calling. So this is my fifth novel set during World War II, and my fourth set specifically in World War II France. So as Linda mentioned, I was also for a long time a contributor to People Magazine, where I covered everything from the Super Bowl, which I got to go to three times, which was great, um, to the murder of a sheriff-elect, um, to the NBA All-Star Game and the MTV Movie Awards, the stories of police corruption, and of course, as Linda mentioned, celebrity interviews with people ranging from Kevin Costner, Ben Affleck, um, Matthew McConaughey, um, Outkast, Walter Cronkite, even John Glenn. So it's those last two, actually, who tied directly into my road to writing about the Second World War. So you see, as Linda said, my very favorite stories at People weren't the celebrity ones, although I do admit it was... Um, wonderful to go uh, hang out with people like Patrick Dempsey or Sarah Jessica Parker or whoever. But, um, but my favorites were actually the ones we called the Heroes Among Us stories, which were the tales of ordinary people doing extraordinary things to help make the world a better place. So if you've read any of my work so far, and I know some of you have, um, that might sound familiar to you. It tends to be a recurring theme in my novels. This idea that we all have the capacity to be extraordinary, especially in times of darkness. So over the years at People, I had the opportunity to interview lots and lots of amazing individuals, such as Erin Trulewski, who's a homeless woman who founded a successful bakery and used her profits to help send kids to college, or Kate Atwood, an Atlanta woman who founded Kate's Club, a nonprofit for children who've lost a parent after she lost her own mother to breast cancer. But my favorite of those Heroes Among Us stories was the story of Henry Landworth, a Florida man who founded a chain of hotels in the 60s with two good friends, who became a millionaire because of those investments, and who, in 1986, decided to donate most of his fortune to the founding of Give Kids the World, an organization that provides magical vacations to children with critical illnesses and their families. So you might be wondering what that has to do with World War II or with Walter Cronkite and John Glenn, who I mentioned. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about Henry Landworth. So Henry and his sister Margot were born on March 7th, 1927 in Antwerp, Belgium. The family was Jewish and Henry was 13 when he and Margot were separated from their parents, Max and Fanny, and sent east to Nazi concentration camps. Henry spent the years from age 13 to age 18, so five incredibly formative years of his childhood, in several camps, including the infamous Auschwitz. And at the end of the war, though he and Margot remarkably survived, both of their parents were dead. His father was shot to death, and his mother died just a few weeks before the camps were liberated. On his own, with only $20 in his pocket, he climbed aboard a freight ship and made his way to the United States, where he was soon drafted into the Army. Later, he used his GI benefits to learn about hotel management, and he worked his way up from being a junior bellman to a front desk manager in New York. In the 50s, he moved to Florida to manage the 100-room Starlight Motel right here where I am today in Cocoa Beach. Well, I'm not at the Starlight Motel, but I'm in Cocoa Beach, just down the street from it. And of course, Cocoa Beach is right near Cape Canaveral. And the Starlight Motel just so happened to be the hotel that the Mercury 7 astronauts and the journalists who were covering their historic missions soon made home. It was during this time that Henry became best friends with astronaut John Glenn and television journalist Walter Cronkite. And those were friendships that lasted a lifetime. In fact, in separate interviews for people, 
Both Glenn and Cronkite told me that Henry Landworth was one of the most amazing people they'd ever met. And when you think about the lives that those two men led, that is saying quite a lot. So in any case, the three men went into business together years later to invest in some hotels, leaning heavily on Henry's expertise in the field. That's how they made their millions, and that's how Henry, by the mid-80s, was in the position to have millions to donate to the founding of Give Kids the World. But why found an organization to help terminally ill children? After all, that didn't have anything to do with the Holocaust or the terrible things that Henry had lived through, or did it? One of the things that stuck with me after our interview was the simplicity behind his motivation. This is my therapy, he told me. I see myself in those children's faces. I did not have control over my life at all, and they did not have any over theirs either. I was so moved by that. And his words stuck with me for years after the fact too. The same year that that people story ran, Henry won the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Award for humanitarian contributions to the health of humankind, which is obviously no small feat. He won dozens of other awards and honors in his lifetime. And if you had visited Give Kids the World and had the chance to meet him there, in that place, you might have left deeply impressed by his warmth and compassion. He was warm and compassionate. He was a good man, a kind man, a man who turned a terrible past into a brilliant future that helped thousands. But you know what stayed with me more than anything? It was one small thing he said in passing during our interview. In order to survive in the concentration camps, I had to learn to turn my feelings off, he told me. And when it was all over, I didn't know how to turn them back on again. Mm -hmm. He said that the only time he felt anything at all was when he was at the Give Kids the World Village, spending time with the children he identified with so very much. And though I think his life was probably quite happy in the end, I think there was always a great sadness there too. Imagine that, he had his childhood stolen from him, but not just his childhood. When the Nazis came and put him in a concentration camp, simply because he was Jewish, they took away his ability to open his heart and to feel the things we all feel throughout the rest of his life. Basic emotions we take for granted. That thought took my breath away, it still does. I had the chance to speak with Henry once more after the publication of my 2012 novel, The Sweetness of Forgetting, which was my first novel featuring World War II. In it, one of the main characters is a woman named Rose who survives the Holocaust in France with the help of, interestingly enough, the Muslims of the Grand Mosque of Paris, and that's actually based on a true story. But years later, Rose has dementia and no one knows her real story. She locked it away years ago just to survive and she never knew how to unlock that box to feel those things she was supposed to feel until the dementia set in. Her character, her specific psychological reaction to the war was based loosely on those words of Henry Landworth, which had stayed with me for all those years. I was able to tell him that toward the end, but like Rose, his memory was fading by then. He passed away in April 2018 at the age of 91, but the mark he left, not just in Give Kids the World, but in several other charities too, plus in the way he inspired my words, is indelible. You've got to give of yourself, he told me. Not money, but the essence of yourself. That's what makes life meaningful. Indeed, that's a lesson that my characters learn too, in many of my novels, but especially in this latest novel of mine, The Book of Lost Names, which is, as I mentioned, my fifth set at least partially during World War II, and my fourth set in World War II France. It's the story of a female forger in World War II who stumbles into the French resistance mostly by accident and winds up helping save the lives of hundreds of children. So she's a graduate student working at the Sorbonne Library in Paris when her father, a Polish-born Jew, is arrested. She and her mom are also on a list for deportation, and so they flee using documents that she has hastily falsified herself. They wind up in a small French mountain town in the unoccupied zone, where a priest working for a local resistance network finds out about her false papers, approaches her, and offers her help in getting her father out of detention in exchange for her helping him with some forged documents, because it turns out she's pretty good at it. So she reluctantly agrees, and soon she meets Remy, an accomplished forger with a chip on his shoulder, who grudgingly takes her on as an assistant and then realizes that she's actually a better forger than he is. 
She becomes passionate, not just about saving the children, but also about preserving their real identities, especially those who are too young to remember who they really are once their names have been changed. So they decide to encode those identities in a 1732 religious text, which they begin referring to as the Book of Lost Names, hence the title of the book. But toward the end of the war, after their resistance cell is blown and Remy disappears, the book goes missing too, possibly looted by the Nazis as they pull out of France. 60 years later, Ava is a librarian working in Winter Park, Florida, and she happens to glimpse the book in an article in the New York Times about Nazi looted books and the search to re return them to their rightful owners, which is something that is ongoing. It's a real thing happening right now. So as the story unfolds in the past, we also see Ava in the present trying to summon the courage to travel to Berlin to finally uncover the last secret held within the pages of the Book of Lost Names. So I would love to read the first page and a half or so, just a very quick, very short reading of the Book of Lost Names to give you a little glimpse into how the story begins to unfold in case you have not read it yet. Um, and like I said, it should only last quickly. And then I'll show you a couple cool things and then I'll open it up to questions. So if you have any questions for me, um, feel free to begin typing them in now. I know Linda's gonna take some um, from the chat in just a moment and I would love to answer anything you wanna ask me. So this is just the very beginning of the book, chapter one, May, 2005. It's a Saturday morning and I'm midway through my shift at the Winter Park Public Library when I see it. The book I last laid eyes on more than six decades ago. The book I believed had vanished forever. The book that meant everything to me. It's staring out at me from a photograph in the New York Times, which someone has left open on the returns desk. The world goes silent as I reach for the newspaper, my hand trembling nearly as much as it did the last time I held the book. It can't be, I whisper. I gaze at the picture. A man in his 70s looks back at me, his snowy hair sparse and wispy, his eyes frog-like, behind bulbous glasses. 60 years after end of World War II, German librarian seeks to reunite looted books with rightful owners, declares the headline. And I wanna cry out to the man in the image that I am the rightful owner of the book he's holding, the faded leather bound volume with the peeling bottom right corner and the gilded spine. It belongs to me and to Remy, a man who died long ago, a man I vowed after the war to think of no more. But he's been in my thoughts this week anyhow, despite my best efforts. Tomorrow, the 8th of May, the world will celebrate the 60th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. It's impossible, with all the young newscasters speaking solemnly of the war, as if they could conceivably understand it, not to think of Remy, not to think of the time we spent together then, not to think of the people we saved and the way it all ended. Though my son tells me I'm blessed to have such a sharp mind in my old age, like many blessings, this one is mixed. Most days, I just long to forget. So that brings me pretty naturally into talking about something else, um, the real documents I've used in my research for this book. And I know Linda had asked me for photographs of those documents. Normally, I just show them, but um, it turned out that it was good she asked me because it coincided with me going on vacation, so I didn't need to bring... Um, you know, the real 1732 book with me. So I think Linda's going to show some pictures. Yeah, so I'm bringing those up now, starting with the Nazi travel document. Yeah, so this is one of the things I used in my research. Um, so uh, the book, of course, as I mentioned, is about forgers. And um, this was a real document that um, was from December 1940 in Paris issued by the Nazis um, in Paris. And it is exactly the kind of thing that, um, that forgers would have been forging because you could not travel around France without one of these saying that you were legally allowed to move about the country. So I know Linda's showing you a close up of that document right now, um, but you can get an idea of it. You can see that it's, uh, even though it was issued in the center of France, it's written in German, um, but there's obviously French in there too. So it's sort of an interesting document and getting my hands actually physically on that, um, that piece of paper um, helped me to really understand the, uh, the work that the forgers would have done, um, the differences between papers, um, the way things were stamped and embossed and things like that. So that was the, na the Nazi issued um, travel document. 
um, just issued to a, a typical French person. I also have copies of the Journal Officiel. Oh yeah, and you can see the, the Nazi stamp on there also. Um, which was something that forgers would have had to, um, to uh, duplicate um, with enough authenticity to fool, um, to fool police officers and soldiers who might be checking papers. So there was also a um, journal officiel, um, which is mentioned several times in the novel. It is the official government document of France. Um, it recorded everything. It came out um, five times a week, it recorded things like naturalizations, marriages, divorces, property transfers, and it was um, a very common resource, resource for forgers when they were looking for false identities. Because you couldn't just say, this is Linda Levon and she's, in, she's from Paris, I promise. Um, you had to actually have somebody with a real paper trail, a real person that you were basing your false identity on. And the Journal Officiel was one place that forgers um, actually found those identities. So um, I have several of those um, and they were a great help to me um, in, in crafting this. Um, again, just having that tool that forgers would have used was so helpful. Um, and then the third item that I sent uh, Linda some pictures of was the actual real life book of lost names, um, which was the book I based the book inside the novel on. So the code that I mentioned within the book, book of lost names is fiction. Um, that was something I came up with uh, myself um, as a way for uh, Ava and Remy, the two main forgers in the book to preserve the names of children. But as I was writing about that code, I was using the real pages of this real 1732 religious text to do that encoding. Um, so that was pretty neat. It's a real book published in 1732. It was a weekly guide to the masses. Um, Ava and Remy do most of their work in a small kind of hidden church library. And this is exactly the kind of nondescript book that would have been on the shelves. Um, so having this, uh, this real book was a great help to me. And I put my hand on it every day during the writing of the novel. And it was something that, um, that really connected me to the past. So those were kind of my, my real life, um, my real life research inspirations that sat on my desktop and that um, really connected me to the past that I was writing about. Um, so yeah, so you will see that research um, kind of come to life within the pages of the novel. Um, and, and it was kind of just fascinating to have all of those things and to have that, um, that heightened understanding of exactly the work that forgers would have been doing. So as I mentioned, the Book of Lost Names came out uh, last month from Gallery Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. If you haven't read it yet, it's a fast paced World War II novel about ordinary people doing extraordinary things to change the world. And it's about the power of forging our own identities, even when people want to take those identities away. So I hope you'll consider picking it up. I hope you'll feel inspired by it. And I hope that you'll remember, especially now during these strange times in our country's history, in our world's history, that it's often in the darkness that we find the brightest light within us. So much like Henry Landworth, who I mentioned, and much like Ava in the Book of Lost Names, we all have the power to change our own corners of the world for the better. We all have the capacity to be heroes in our families, in our work lives, in our communities. And we all have the power to rise up and meet the extraordinary challenges we're facing now and to use the strength within us to make the world a better place. So go out there and be a hero like Ava and the real forgers who came before her. Be you, find your own extraordinary. And thank you again, Linda, for having me, Joe, for facilitating this. And uh, now I would love to open it up to questions. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for sharing your documents that you used. Um, it really shines a light into the book. Um, it's talked about so much. So um, we do have some questions. I uh, know Dolores has started, mm -hmm. I think, to say um, how much of the story was um, in the Book of Lost Names was based off of real history. It got cut off, so I'm guessing that's what she oh, meant. Okay. Wait, was that was that it, Dolores? Is that, a, is that what you're asking? I think I see you down there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I've read the book, and I just was curious how much of it was. You already said the code was fictional, but um, the rest, of, how much of the other part of the book is for real? So, great question, Dolores. Um, Ava, the main character, is based. Um, 
on several forgers kind of rolled into one, um, but two forgers in particular, um, I were probably the strongest inspiration for her. Um, their names were um, Oscar Rosowski and Adolfo Kaminsky. So Kaminsky was a young forger in Paris and Rosowski was a young forger in the south of France. Like Ava, they were both young, they were both Jewish, they were both um, in their early 20s. I actually think Oscar Rosowski might have even been in his late teens when, um, when he, he got into forgery. And you know, one of the things I had wondered about when I set out to write this book about forgers was how on earth you would get into something like that. Um, you know, was there somebody to train you? How, how would you become a forger? And um, with those two men, as well as with hundreds of other people who found their way into this movement, um, there was no formal training. So uh, once these forgery bureaus became established, uh, the forgers were able to train people who worked under them. But the ones who began these forgery bureaus wandered into it from walks of life that turned out to be perfect training. Um, Rosowski wanted to be a doctor and was planning to go to medical school when the war started. Well, actually before the war started and he was barred from doing that because he was Jewish. Um, but he was very analytical and was used to thinking about things very analytically and very carefully. And I think that prepared him to be a good forger. Um, uh, Adolfo Kaminsky in Paris, um, who wound up running a very, um, very large, very successful forgery network that saved, I mean, probably 14,000 lives. I think he's estimated to have saved just himself 14,000 people with these false documents, which is extraordinary. Um, he actually had um, had worked for a dairy farmer. Um, so if you read the book, you might remember that one of the things mm -hmm. Randy comes up with is a way to dissolve Waterman's blue ink on documents using right. acid. That actually comes from this real life forger, Adolfo Kaminsky, who when he was about 13 or 14, um, did that with the dairy farmer to prove whether cream had been watered down. They would put this chemical compound that was one of the main compounds of, um, of, uh, of Waterman's blue ink in, and depending on how quickly it dissolved in the cream, that would show them you know, whether the cream was real or diluted or whatever. Um, so people kind of came to this through all different backgrounds. So that part was, was real. Those, those influences for Ava's forgery and her skills were real. The way they did their forgeries was real. Um, the way they got their papers, some, some of the papers were made, some of them were airdropped in from Free Algeria, which is so interesting. Um, and the town, of, um, the town that they do their forgeries in, the town they settle in, uh, was fictional, but it was very much based on the area that Oscar Rosowski was in, in the, um, in the southern part of France. Um, so I didn't base it on that real town because I wanted to have a little bit of liberty with the details and with the people helping out and with how it all worked. But it was based, um, based very closely on that and, and a lot of those details were real, as were the way that they escaped to Switzerland. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. So what resources had, did you find were the most helpful just from Deborah? Um, so Deborah, great, great question. So the resources I found the most helpful were probably the ones I, um, I just showed you um, or with, with Linda's help, um, those real life documents that helped me to really get my hands on things. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is actually the, uh, well, so I don't think I mentioned this. I lived in Paris myself um, when I was in my 20s. So I think just having that background of, um, of being in France and spending time in France and sort of having an understanding of the culture was helpful. I think having written um, four other books set in World War II France was tremendously helpful because I've done a lot of the research as to um, how things worked during that time period, how the resistance worked in particular. My last two books involved the French resistance as this one did. Um, and then, yeah, there was a book called A Good Place to Hide, um, which uh, was about forgery, or in part about forgery. There was a book called A Forger's Life, which was about forgery uh, during and after the war. Um, and then there, there's a great book that I've used as a resource for several of my novels now. It's, um, it's a, just a, 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 um, like a, a research book, a, a resource, not, a, um, not fiction or anything, but it's um, just called Jews in France in World War II. I think that's the name of it. Um, and it's fantastic. It's just a big, thick, like 800 page book that has absolutely anything I could possibly dream of knowing. Um, and in fact, I did come across something I needed to know for my last book and I couldn't find it in this big, thick 800 page book. And I was like, what am I going to do? Um, and fortunately, right around that time, um, a young woman emailed me from Israel where my books do very well. My, my books are um, 
have, have been translated into Hebrew and are sold in Israel and, and sell very well there. And she had read, um, I think it was the room on Ruamali where I had, I had mentioned that resource book. Um, and she wrote and said, my gosh, my mother wrote that book. She'll be thrilled to know that it helped you. Um, may I put the two of you in touch? And now when I can't find an answer to one of those pressing questions, I just email her mother and it's wonderful. It's like having my own like research librarian just at my fingertips with exactly the specific knowledge I need. So that's been very helpful too. Great. What a great resource. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you've read several books in World War II as you're talking about. So Joe's asking, um, is there anything in your Holocaust research and World War II research that surprised you? Um, oh gosh, I mean, lots of things surprised me. Um, and, and that's, that's a good question. Um, I think for, I mean, every, every time I research a book, there are things that are surprising. I was so surprised, as I mentioned, just about how people would have found their way into forgery and how people would have, um, how people would have developed these techniques, like the one I mentioned with the lactic acid. I mean, who in a million years would think to apply that to dissolving indelible ink? But it, but I mean, that, that came from a dairy farmer. Who would have ever thought? Um, I, I was surprised to learn all the different kinds of papers that went into making documents in the 1940s and that you couldn't just you know, go up and pick up the type of paper you needed from a stationery shop or a specialty shop. Um, they actually had to be made other places or you had to divide or devise methods to make these papers. I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, for my last novel, uh, I was really interested to learn, my last novel, The Winemaker's Wife, was set in Champagne, France and involved a champagne house during World War II. And one of the things I found really fascinating um, in the research for that book was just how involved some of the big champagne makers, the names we all know today, actually were with the resistance. So when I began to research that book, I thought, well, I, you know, I don't know, the resistance might have been a little bit active here, but I don't really know how active. Well, it turned out that the head of Moet et Chandon, one of the major champagne brands, but one we all, you know, it, it, it's probably a name that sounds familiar today because it's one of the biggest champagne brands in the world. And in fact, one of the biggest liquor brands in the world is um, Moet Hennessy. Um, and it actually is Moet, not Moet. I always used to think it was Moet way, but it's Moet. Um, but um, the head, the actual head of, of uh, Moet et Chandon in world, during World War II um, was working with the Nazis because he also had, I mean, it helped, you know, he was like the face of Champagne who dealt with the Nazis and who dealt with their demands and their negotiations. But behind their back, he was actually leading the resistance, the political arm of the resistance in that part of France. So I think that's fascinating. I mean, just to know now that if you pick up a glass of that champagne, you know, from vine, for, you know, from the very earth that these people were walking on 75 years ago, you're basically drinking a glass that comes from this heroic tradition. So it, it's little things like that. I, I think I just, um, I love those little connections to the past and anything that, that I, can make us feel that way is really inspiring and surprising to me, I think. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the characters in the book. Um, so Eva is the, the character. This is really focused around and she runs away from Paris after her father is arrested and taken to concentration camp and she has her mother with her. So she's trying to get her out of the country and was told to go to this small town in France. I'll let you pronounce it because I will kill it. <laughs> but um, I'm curious about it. She meets Remy, who is already forging documents. Um, there's not a lot of background it has told about him. So I wonder if that was really by design and your thoughts about kind of creating this, this mysterious character. Um, well, I, I mean, I think we find out bits and pieces of his background as we go. Um, I, but I, I think that um, I think that he is sort of reserved and and mysterious a little bit. And I think that there was some necessity for that. I mean, I, I don't think you just in the resistance before you knew people, you, you knew them well and knew for sure you could trust them. Um, I don't think you just walked up and said like, hey, here's who I am, here's who my family is, this is my whole life story, because that could be very dangerous. Um, so I think that um, in the case of Remy, she knows what she knows what the priest knows, um, which is that Remy comes from a, um, a, a resistance network in Paris where he learned to forge. Um, and he has come to them there. Um, 
And, you know, I think there was a little bit more in my first draft about Remy's background. I think I initially had the idea that he, he had come into contact in France with, um, with somebody that Ava wound up working with in the resistance network. I mean, in, in Paris with somebody uh, that Ava ends up working with um, in this small mountain town. Um, and then it just felt like that was too much of a coincidence. So that was kind of initially part of his background. Um, but I, I, I wanted him to be a little bit of a tough nut to crack and somebody who wasn't just, you know, blah, here I am. Like it, he had to be somebody who, um, who played things kind of close to the best, if that makes sense. So we have a priest that is really housing the forgery um, whole workshop. So Pierre Clement is the priest there. Was that um, historically true that the Catholic Church and the priests were heavily involved in getting children out? And yes, and it, it wasn't just Catholics. It was it was uh, Protestants too. So um, there was an area of France called the Plateau that this is partially loosely based on. Um, and it, in, in the plateau, the minister who was who was kind of in charge of the that part of the resistance there, that part of the movement there, uh, is I can't remember off the top of my head whether he was Presbyterian or Lutheran, but he was a Protestant minister who um, who uh, believed in peaceful resistance. So um, he was against taking up arms, um, but he was also against what was happening. Um, to these innocent people and particularly these innocent children. And as is the case in the novel, uh, they lived in an area um, that was not strategically advantageous in any way to the Nazis. So um, it was an area that, yes, there was a German presence there because there was a German presence all over France. Um, but in that particular area, uh, it was easy to hide people. There were a lot of places to hide. And it, it had, prior to the war, been a, um, kind of a resort town, like a, just a resort town in the mountains that people from the cities would escape to uh, during the summer. Um, and sometimes parents would send their children to, to camps there in the summer. And so with people no longer coming down on vacations, there were all these vacation homes and large um, facilities avail available to use as orphanages orphanages for, for these children who, um, the word didn't sound right, for, for, the, for the children who were fleeing without their parents. Um, and yes, that was run and orchestrated um, by the church. Okay. Which I really interesting. Okay, so we know that this really did go on. The children were given new names, um, were taken out of the country to Britain, to U.S., to Switzerland. Um, what do you, what can you tell us about if any of these children were reunited with their parents after the war? A lot of the parents perished. Um, I, I think that we um, we tend to think of uh, the Holocaust as something that happened other places than France, um, but um, but there were more than 70,000 people. I'm trying to remember the exact number off the top of my head, and I, I can't off the top of my head. Um, 76,000, 78,000, something like that. Uh, people who perished, Jewish people who perished in France. Um, and a lot, it might, it might have been more than that. I don't know why that number's sticking in my head. Um, normally I have the numbers in front of me, but I have vacation brain and sorry, the, the beach. <laughs> That's understandable. Um, but, uh, so a lot of those children who were sent on without their parents um, did unfortunately very, very sadly find at the end of the war that their parents had died um, in concentration camps. But most of them, I think, were reunited with family members of some sort um, and were at least reunited with their names and their identities. Um, you know, so in some cases, um, children were sent on to the United States to live with um, you know, aunts or uncles or, or cousins or whatever, um, or you know, to other places or um, or onto Israel, or they were adopted by Jewish families um, who had survived. Um, and, and I mean, in, in some cases, certainly they were reunited with parents or with one parent who had survived in those, uh, in those miraculous cases. But I think that um, unfortunately, because of, you know, just what the, the unfortunate things that happened during the war, a lot of those families were not intact after the war. Hmm. All right, so question. Um... Eva's mother it was Polish, and they she called her Mama Yusia. Is that how you would pronounce it? I was wondering that. Uh, Mamusha. Mamusha. Um, she was uh, very upset with Eva for being involved in this, 
and uh, really gave Eve a hard time. Um, this was a surprise, she says, when she wasn't supportive of given what they were going through and that um, the, the father had been arrested and taken as well. So give us your thoughts on what was that about with Mamusha and why did she really react that way? Um, so Mamusha um, was a, um, was very set in her ways. I think Mamusha, the mother, um, was, she married when she was young. Her whole life centered around her husband and her child. Her world was relatively small. Um, when her husband is taken and she believes he's now gone, um, I mean, because he is, he's been taken off to this concentration camp. It's terrible. Um, she, she doesn't know what to do and she blames everybody and she blames herself and she blames Ava. And I think, you know, it, it's kind of one of the complaints I've had about the novel. People say, oh, I don't, I don't like the mother, but I think the mother's very real. Um, people don't all rise to the occasion and become better versions of themselves when, when tough times happen. Um, I think for a lot of people, and it, it, and it's an understandable reaction, the reaction is to retreat into what you feel is safest, which is for the mother, for Mamusha, what feels safest to her is um, keeping everything as close to as it was as she can. So she doesn't totally grasp that the world's changing around her and she has to change with it. She wants Ava to stand in place. She wants herself to stand in place. She wants to just sit there and wait for the husband to come back, the father to come back. Um, and most of all, she wants Ava to, to adhere to all the things um, that she felt were values for her that, that, you know, you have to, you can't, what are you doing out there? Um, you know, falling in love with this young Catholic man, spending all this time with this young Catholic man. It's totally inappropriate. That's, you know, that's not what we do. And, um, she's very stuck in the past. And I think Ava is looking toward the future. Um, and, uh, I, I think the way that that relationship unfolds is very, natural. There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of blame. Um, and it is something that Ava has to overcome, um, but also grow while continuing to respect her mother, which kind of sets up some challenges for her. Yeah, Ava is really found in this dilemma of trying to help Jewish children and Jewish people but yet it's pulling her out of her culture and in, around um, people who are Catholic and other things and out of what had been her little world before. And it, she really questions, and is this right? And, um, or am I really um, coming out of my Jewish family and culture? Yeah, 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 it, it, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's something that she really, um, I think she's having to face within herself. I mean, one of the questions that kind of echoes throughout this novel is um, what is identity? Are, are we more than just a name? Are we more than just our background? Can we forge our own identities? Um, and, uh, and, and what happens when you disguise your identity? What happens when someone tries to erase your identity? And those are all um, questions that Ava is struggling with. And I think her mother's influence um, uh, helps to make those questions swirl even a little bit more confusingly for her. Well, and it, those kinds of things are something we all face. We all have to come in a point in our lives that we decide whether to keep the values and beliefs that our parents taught us, or do we reject some of those and find our own? And that's a lot of what Eva, I thought was a real underlying theme in the whole story. Really interesting. Great. Um, anybody else have some questions? Okay. Um, I, I apologize, Phyllis. She asks the great questions, but it'll give the ending away of the book. So I don't want to do that in case <laughs> some people haven't read it, but I'm curious too. But it's, um, I, yeah, I think it would give too much away. So we won't do that one. Great. Well, we uh, really appreciate everyone's participation and for the book. It, I just thoroughly enjoyed the book. I, I thought it was great. Um, I, I was surprised. There were things that um, I did not see coming, um, which is great because I find sometimes in books that I kind of you know, suspect and I, uh, they can't fool me. Uh, no, I was, I was definitely fooled. So <laughs> thank you for the wonderful read and Congratulations on its success.
Thank you. And thanks to all of you who came today. I see Anissa patiently listening to me for like the 10 billionth time. Anissa always is so supportive and so wonderful. And I see Dolores and Phyllis smiling at me there and Catherine. And I see all these names that I, I know there are faces behind them. Bev and Anita and Franklin and Tisa. That would have a pretty name. That's interesting. Robin, Jean, Dale, Mary. Uh, Darfkin, Lisa, LHP, <laughs> lots of people. Patricia up there, Joe. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. I, I really appreciate it. And um, Kristen was great enough to send us a signed copy of the book. So we were going to draw a name from those who participate today. So Dale Schneider, you're going to be the winner of the book. Thanks for participating. And um, since you registered, I have your information. We'll be in touch with getting that to you. So hopefully, um, if you have read it, then you have a great memory there with the signed book. So. Thank you, Kristen. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. It's fascinating. We look forward to reading your book. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. And I appreciate that. It's, it's, a, it's a great book. So thank you all. And I um, hope you will uh, join in on our Yahoo Fest. Uh, and also later on, we've got Ron Rash, who's going to be coming, uh, as well as some others, as I won't give it all away, um, who's coming. I, I will mention, if you have not heard, we're very sad today to hear about the passing of Randall Keenan, uh, one of the great Southern authors um, who died, uh, I believe it was yesterday, unexpectedly. So we're, we are mourning his loss and um, he had a new book that just came out not too long ago. So just pass that along to everyone um, who is a fan of Fellowship of Southern Writers and he was the president. So um, on that sad note, I thank you again for coming and please feel free to contact me if you have questions and watch our website and social media for more. Have okay. a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your help, Joe. Have a great day. Bye.